This week, the Ministry of Defence rolled out a new division to deal with the grey zone, that place where countries like Russia, Iran and China might use information and cyber warfare or unleash their proxies. However, defence nerds, sorry, but guilty, quickly spotted that the 6th Division wasn't really new at all. It was simply a repackaging of existing units formerly run from headquarters called Force Troops. By this time, though, the story had already got into the news cycle, with Kremlin-backed station RT weighing into the fray. It's not a bad parable, parable for how these days even attempts to combat fake news can end up spawning it. Invention, distortion and people trusting gut instinct rather than fact. These are not new things. History is littered with forged letters, scapegoating of minorities and the willful distortion of truths. So what is it about this moment? Why the preoccupation with fake news? Perhaps it's the intersection of economic woes and the communication possibilities of the internet. Nativism and hostility to immigration can be traced back to polls showing growing pessimism across the developed world. Once people's faith in the future falters, it becomes that much easier to search for someone to blame, to fight over dwindling opportunities and raise the national drawbridge. Add the tendency of so many of us to use social media as a method of confirming our biases rather than challenging them, and the scene is set for an increasingly violent clash of ideas. Even when the facts are true, the long debate over Brexit shows they can be cherry-picked from the complexity of our economic and social relationships, undermining the shared truth that underpins politics. Events like the shooting down of flight MH17 over Ukraine provide another template, deliberately spawning alternative narratives so that everything becomes possible and nothing is true. Is that now our common future? Well, who better to discuss the post-truth world than Peter Pomerantsev, whose new book, This Is Not Propaganda, has just been published, and Kate Williams, Professor of Modern History at Reading University. Welcome both. Peter, if I can start with you, uh, you've, got, you've got this new book out, and your theory is the Russian uh, way of doing this has become the general global way of doing it. How did that happen? I think the paradox is that by losing the Cold War, Russia arrived in this sort of world that we're entering in now much, much earlier. Um, and I think even before we get to the tools which have amplified these various propaganda pathologies, there's something much bigger going on. Uh, your program just mentioned uh, the end of an idea of the future. I mean, in Russia, that happened much earlier. Communism first ends and then it's kind of opposite. Democratic capitalism collapses with terrible reforms in the early 1990s. And so all the kind of rational ways that politicians had of signaling where they were going collapse. And they turn to a politics of feeling, a politics of nostalgia, uh, a politics where you actually throw up uh, and, you know, say goodbye to facts with a kind of, and you revel in that. Uh, um, that becomes almost pleasurable. We see that with, with Donald Trump. We might be seeing that with our new prime minister as well. You had this in Russian politicians in the early 90s already. Um, and we've kind of caught up, I think, after 2008, after the great financial crash. Sort of end of optimism. Yeah, the end of a clear idea of the future, where we're going. And we're kind of entering that same phase now. And briefly, do you regard this as a, a right-wing or authoritarian thing or left-wing? Is, is it now across the board politically, do you think, think in developed... I think I think this is just Post truth. This is the sort of information sea that we that we uh, that we swim in. I still think there are sects of society who still feel they're doing quite well, who still do have a sense of the future, and you know they're still watching the BBC or reading. Uh, Thank uh, yes, <laughs> and, and 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 reading legacy media and legacy newspapers, uh, but many more don't, uh, and that's of course the ones that are uh, the leaders that you just spoke to appeal to. Kate Williams, look, is there an element of Twas Ever Thus in terms of scurrilous tracts about uh, Catholics in the 17th century or, you know, the Golden Riots or whatever, that, that, that fake news, rumour, incitement, uh, that these things have always been about? We've always had propaganda, we've always had fake news, and part of human uh, ambition and desires is to create propaganda. But 
it's very different now. I think, obviously, we had the, the printing press revolutionized propaganda. Suddenly, for example, as we seen in the Civil War, in the Civil War, 30,000 pieces of propaganda were produced, mainly on the parliamentary. A lot of them on the, the parliamentarians were brilliant at producing propaganda, saying that there was going to be a Catholic takeover. We see all these examples of propaganda around the British Empire, saying it's a marvelous way to live, the sun never sets on it. Propaganda to make uh, young men sign up with the war in World War I, brilliantly effective, but not effective enough, so they have to bring in conscription. But the difference is, is that so many of these types of propaganda, really you can't have an effective government without it. Uh, in the past, have been about nations creating their own myths. So the Tudors create their own myths of brilliance, even though the Tudors really had a very small claim to the throne. Nations create their own myths of genius and brilliance. And trying to undermine other nations, that's really very difficult. We have, you know, Lord Haw Haw was hardly the most effective and, uh, you know, pro-Nazi propaganda uh, purported during World War Two people just threw well, cushions. Well, these days the... he'd have his own YouTube channel. Well, presumably. yeah, people just threw cushions at the, at the radio. Uh, you know, we think of Americans dropping leaflets in Vietnam. It doesn't. It just. It just isn't effective. But propaganda is brilliantly effective within nations, but outside of them, it's very hard to undermine other nations. But what you have now is this completely different setup with the internet. It's faster. It's quicker. It's more emotive. It's monetized. But also because we're passing it around between friends, it seems Pick more trusted. And this is the way in which nations are undermining each other. Picking up on your point about speed, I mean, uh, if you fact-check President Trump, what you often find is that a day or two later, when you've come up with the answer to whether or not some claim was false, he's already moved on through another couple of news cycles. Nobody cares anymore, do they? Yeah, I mean, I think there's two things going on, uh, going on here. Because of the uh, um, sort of the volume of information, uh, the strategy now is to flood it with so much, whether it's Russia, whether you're uh, sort of part of Trump's uh, machine, where you know, the battle for one speck of a fact is completely irrelevant. Um, and actually, you know, there's quite a lot of studies that show that sometimes, uh, I don't know, maybe even fact-checking has a reverse effect, because even by mentioning uh, the lies that these people say, they kind of rest in people's minds and stay there. And Repeat I, it I, again. Yeah. And I think uh, the thing is about propaganda, whether it's, with, whether it's someone like President Trump or whether it's someone undermining other nations, is it's simple. And actually, the reality and the truth is much more complicated. There are nuances, there are different sides. But to say, make a simple statement such but as does... the Catholics are going to overtake us or all, uh, you know, for example, in the witch hunts, that was all propaganda, all women are witches. You know, that's so much the more The devil simpler always has the best, best the choose. The best lines. But, 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 but does that mean there's no way out of this now, do you think? Or is there a way you can see I that, think... that a more rational less superheated. I think what we're having is much more awareness because when the internet first came in, I did have a job in an early internet company and all we were trying to do was sell people stuff. How can we sell more? But of course, what people are doing now with the gold standard is to get hold of people's votes and to get hold of people's hearts, whether it's voting or governments or anti-vaccines or whatever it is. And so I think we're now increasingly more aware that these images that we might see on the on Especially on Facebook, which is the best place, I think, works much more successfully, Peter, can be wrong. You've got 30 seconds to tell us how to solve this huge issue. Sure. Don't focus on content. We won't be able to uh, control content in a user-generated era. We have to kind of reveal and be much more transparent about how information is created, whether something is a bother or a troll, whether al why algorithms show us one piece of content and not another. We have to sort of rip away the whole uh, backstage of how content is produced and delivered. Uh, and that should be a fundamental right we have. And then we can start making a much more rational judgment about why Peter, certain things are reaching us. Peter and Kate, thank you both very much. Well, look, let's... Uh, well,